Steve Coster, president of Washington Laboratories LTD, has over 30 years of experience in testing systems and device for regulatory compliance. His expertise spans a full range of product evaluation from IT, medical, machinery, measuring, and communication, including wireless. He has the Washington Laboratory team accomplishing all manner of product compliance evaluations. In addition, is presently on the TCB Council Board of Directors and on the ACL CAS Executive Committee. So without further ado, let's turn our attention to emission measurements for electrical and electronic equipment with Steve Coster. Hi, Steve. How are you? Good, thank you. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for spending time with us uh, looking over emissions measurements um, for all devices that are electrical, electronic, and this is primarily for the uh, um, consumer field, consumer um, type products. It's not for military products. It's not dealing with transmitters at this time, things along that nature. What are we going to look at? We're going to look at ANSI C63.4, which is really quite uh, um, universally accepted as a basic test procedure. Uh, how does your unit have to be configured in order to be tested properly? What do we do with all those cables? I mean, there's a uh, there's a lot of information on what we do with the radiate with the emissions or the cable interface cabling for the device. Uh, we'll look a little bit at the what are radiated emissions measurements, conductive emissions measurements, and a lot of this is uh, pertaining to tabletop equipment. Although C63.4 does cover the floor standing devices as well, and I could probably touch on that if we need to. Feel free to send in questions through the chat function. Um, and we will do our best to answer them in real time. If not, we'll be able to send out information at, after the meeting. Let's start with ANSI C63.4. Uh, 2014 is the version that's currently being used by most, most places. Um, it is the national standard for methods of measurements of radio noise emissions from low voltage electrical and electronic equipment has a range of nine kilohertz to 40 gigahertz. Well, there's a few things that go to 40 gigahertz, but not that many. Um, and we do the we do see a lot of low frequency devices at this time um, in various things like RFID, etc. So wh why do we use ANSI? Well, ANSI, ANSI C63.4 is called out in the FCC Part 15 as a measurement standard. 15.31 specifically tells you which measurement standards are acceptable to the FCC for showing compliance to the FCC requirements. Uh, the ICES 003 Issue 7 in Canada also calls out the ANSI C63.4 2014 as one of the two, ex two accepted measurement standards. Their other accepted measurement standard is the uh, CAS, uh, it's basically the 55032, but it's the Canadian, the CAN5, the CAN32, which is the same as, uh, which is derived from CISPR32 for emissions. Uh, and, and 36 CISPR 63.4 contains all the measurement standard information, how you do the measurements, how what your test site needs to be, et cetera, et cetera. But it doesn't show you what the limits are. The limits come out of these other standards like FCC Part 15 and Canada ICES 003. 003. So there's a basic configuration. Why? Why do we do that? Well, we have the standard. The standard helps us from laboratory to laboratory do a standard test. The standard's there to make sure that we're all doing it the same. And theoretically, you should get the same answer from one laboratory to another. 
Um, so they go into things like, well, what do you need to do? Well, if your tabletop device is configuration, configured and it's a PC, for example, um, you have to have all of these minimum number of peripherals. You have to have a keyboard. You have to have a monitor. If, the, if your host PC is the EUT, the cables have to be attached to each I.O. port. So if you have four USB ports, for example, all four of those have to have cables coming off. If the PC is not the EUT, the parallel and serial ports, you see how old some of this is, parallel ports, shall be connected, if not available, suitable different IOs, uh, different um, interface out, input output devices, input output cabling has to be in place. Um, some of that is because sometimes that cabling itself can be used as a radiating element for the device. And of course, any dedicated special purpose ports uh, like a mouse or we used to have joysticks, things like that. Um, I just saw a question come across to all, all the uh, cable, all the ports need to be cabled to a device. Uh, the standard says that it prefers you cable to a device. So if you're cabling a USB cable out to, you, they want you to have a USB type of device at the end of that cable. However, if they're not all available, you are able to use, you are able to simulate that. You can simulate that by terminating the cable in the characteristic impedance. Uh, sometimes I've seen where we've, we've simulated that by doing a, a, a loop back, right? If we're looping back a, a transmit port to a receive port, then we've, all, we've automatically put it back to its characteristic impedance. So as long as you can simulate the impedance properly, um, you can use a, a different cable on the end of that, or you don't have to have a device on the end of that cable. Okay, then there's specific. Sorry, I saw I missed that one. The cables connected to another PCB to power up during this time also should be connected while testing. Uh, if it has to connect to something to power up and then that device is typically brought, taken away, um, it does not have to be there through the entire test as long as it's not typically there. Um, that gets into maintenance ports and things like that that we might cover in a little bit. So let's talk about the EUT placement. Um, for tabletop equipment, you put, put your device on a non-conducting table, 80 centimeters high. It's one and a half by one meter, which is preferred, but it can be smaller or larger as needed. Um, I've had instances, instances where I've had to put two of these tables together in order to accommodate the entire EUT, or um, a smaller table was, works for some of them. There is a figure 13 for the arrangement of the tabletop that we're gonna look at in a minute. Um, if the tabletop systems, for tabletop, the EUT itself is centered laterally, left to right, flush with the rear of the table. If a host PC is used, it should be centered. So if you're, if you've got, if you're testing, the EUT itself is a box and it needs to be on the center of the table on the back of the table. Uh, the EUT is maybe a card or something that goes into a host PC, then that PC should be in the center of the table. Standalone EUTs are placed in the center of the tabletop. Now that's a little bit different because a standalone, a standalone device is typically something that has just a power cord or something along that lines. It's battery powered, things, something to do with that. It really doesn't have a lot of IO cables or any besides the power cord. That gets put into the center of the table instead of along the back edge. Um, we used to put the monitor on top of the host, on top of the uh, the PC, if you will. It was table uh, desktop PC. Now it doesn't work that way. So if you have an external monitor, uh, you kind of put it off to the side. It's not possible 
to put that monitor located 10 centimeters to the left or the right of the hose. Okay, now continuing with that, if you have a, a corded keyboard, the keyboard, or even a wireless one for that matter, the keyboard is centered in front of the monitor flush with the front of the table, kind of where you would be using it if you were sitting at the desk. Uh, the peripherals will be on each side of the host and everything gets a 10 centimeter separation. If only one peripheral is used, you put it on the left. Uh, mouse, joysticks to, uh, are 10 centimeters from the right of the keyboard. Right, because the mouse or your, or your joysticks, things like that, would be right up on the other end of the table where you would be using them. Your keyboard and mouse cabling routed alongside the CPU to access to maximize coupling. So you want to keep that cable right next to the to the uh, computer if at all possible. And don't stack the devices unless it's inherent by design. This shows the basic configuration, and as you can see. The EUT, which in this drawing is a, a desktop computer that we no longer have. Uh, the monitor sits on top of that. All the cabling is bundled and draped on the back of the table. Keyboard's in the front and the mouse is right there by the keyboard. And everything's got 10 centimeter spaces. And as you can see by the dotted lines on the left and the right, you are able to extend that table if you have more peripherals or, or need more room. Then you have the EUT, the, the EUT itself. What does it need to be doing? Well, there's various modes of operations in EUT. And when I first started, the processor speed uh, was controlled by oscillators, and the oscillators could be changed to make it go like four, three or four different processor speeds. And the devices had to be tested in all those speeds. Um, there's also drive access back and forth to read and write, um, going back and forth to the memory, any data transfer like uh, serial port data or the old parallel ports and the printer, um, charging mode if the device that needs to be charged, uh, different modulations may have, uh, may, be, may come from different uh, types of operations and there's different video modes. You got to check all these modes to ensure your final test is in the worst case. And you'll hear that a lot in, in this industry. We're testing the worst case, um, but the worst case is just worst case in normal configure, normal operation. We don't go out of our way to find worst case in something that wouldn't be a typical mode or a typical operation of the device. We just got to make sure that we find and report the highest emissions. Now, C62.4, the 2014, um, did come out with this, this uh, decision tree for video monitors. How, how do you set the video? You know, you set the contrast control to maximum. You want to turn it all the way up. Brightness control to maximum. Um, rasters, I don't know if we see those anymore. Um, set the character size and number of characters per line so the typical maximum number of characters per screen is displayed. That's when we used to, we, we normally, they still call out using the capital H and keep that scrolling across the video monitor in order to exercise the video in or, during test. Is it a color monitor? Well, if it is, set the white letters on a black background. If it's not, select the worst case, positive, negative video. So there's a lot of that. You, you wanna make sure you're getting into these different modes that show that the device is, is emission, has emissions as high as possible because we wanna make sure that even in these modes, uh, the device does not interfere with other units. Uh, is it graphics capable? Um, can you use condensed fonts, uh, you know, all these different things that help you determine exactly how you have to have the monitor scrolling video in order to do the test properly. Basic placement. How about the power assessments? Okay, 
if accessory is not the EUT, but connected to the EUT, you place it on the tabletop with the power cord and the power accessory is less than 80 centimeters. This is uh, those power bricks that you see for laptops a lot. Um, the, that device, the power brick itself, would be sitting on the table next to your EUT. Um, if the power cord to the accessory is greater than 80 centimeters, you can place it on the floor. Um, if the accessory plugs directly into the wall outlet, plug it into the power source directly on top of the ground plane under the EUT, which in turn would be the lizard because that's where that's what you or you wouldn't have the lizard actually in the radiated emissions, but that would be the lizard that conducted. So what if the accessory is the EUT? What if you're testing one of these power brakes? It's got to be placed on the table, even if it's greater than 80 centimeters in length. If it's less than 80 centimeters in length, place it at a height that, such that the power cord is fully extended vertically. Make sure that that's that sending out all the waves from the vertical portion. If it plugs directly into the wall outlet, um, provide an extension cord to make sure you plug that in on the ground by the ground plane, but it, the accessor itself is sitting on the table. So there is times when you have a um, extension cord that you may need to use. So your interface cable, these are cables that go, you know, USB cables, uh, HDMI cables now, things like that, are all inter input output cables interface. And the excess length is draped over the back of the back edge of the table. With the caveat that the cables can be no closer than 40 centimeters to the ground plane. So if you have an 80 centimeter table, these cables can only drape down half of that. So what do you do if the cables are longer than that? Well, you bundle the excess in a serpentine fashion um, using a 30 to 40 centimeter bundle in the center of that cable. And if you've seen a, a device come back from a test lab, you may still see that they've taped or they've, they've somehow secured a bundle in the middle of that cable to allow for it to be in the proper position during testing. And the overall length of the bundle cable should not exceed one meter. One meter cables are, are constant, consistent with what they expect to see for testing. So if you have a one meter cable, you know, we won't have to bundle too much, but uh, it still would be something that we'd, we'd work with. Do not place the cables under or on top of system components unless it's inherent by design. Because if we take in, uh, I've heard stories of people that take like the keyboard cable and wrap it around the keyboard. Um, that's not acceptable. It's not how it's normally used and it can make it have a lot worse uh, emissions than what it really should have in normal operation. And here's a diagram that shows just exactly what we we're talking about. These cables need to be bundled back and forth so that they're no closer, unless the cable is not closer than 40 centimeters. You don't have to bundle it if it just, if it only drapes down 40 centimeters. Um, you'll see all the way on my right hand side, there's a device that's terminated, uh, a cable that's terminated in some sort of little device that's just hanging there, but it still cannot be more than, be closer than 40 centimeters to the ground plane. And the non-conductive table used to be wood was king, it's no longer. Interfacing cables, the cables must be manipulated during exploratory testing to determine the maximum emission configurations. This is uh, done because sometimes when your cabling becomes the, the radiating element and you move that around, it does get uh, cause your emission to increase or decrease. So you try to get that cable to a reasonable position that shows the highest emission and only again only put it in the range of likely arrangements you don't go crazy with it and put it 
you know, decide you're going to tape it to the ceiling of the of, of the test chamber just so that it can be long and and extended that way. Uh, you just do what's kind of normal, and you figure out where that that cable is. You record that position so that you're able to uh, put it in that position for the final test. Now, one of the differences in the latest uh, ANSI 634 is that at that point, you maximize only the highest emission in the final test. Uh, before, before the 2014, we were maximizing every emission we found. Uh, it took a lot longer to get the testing done because you'd, you'd identify an emission, you'd go out, you'd move everything around, you'd find the highest, and then you'd go back and you scroll some more, and uh, it just would take a lot longer than what it was hoped for. So what if you have multiple ports of the same type on an EUT? Well, it says that you add the cables until less than two dB variations are in emissions. Okay, so think about that. You have four, let's say you have four USB ports. You evaluate it with just one cable there. Then you find and put a second cable there and evaluate again, see if it's changed by 2 dB. Uh, then you find a third cable, and if, it, if it's changed by more than two, if it's changed by more than 2 dB, you find a third cable, plug it in. Has it changed by more than 2 dB? Um, do this continuously until you get to where there is no change or you've connected all of the cables. Um, the addition of the cables changes the EUT emissions amplitude closest to the limit by TDB or less does not continue to rise. So the addition of cabling cables changes the EUT emissions amplitude closest to the limit by TDB or less does not continue to rise. So you don't do that, but if the amplitude continues to rise, then um, you add additional cables even if it's less than 2 dB, especially if you're close to the limit. Why do we not use a lizen in radiated testing? What is under the turntable ground plane line filter? Um, is that not causing higher measurements uncertainty by different chamber designs from lab to lab? Um, we, don't, we don't use lizens on the test site. Um, you could. Um, you could use those, but uh, they are are not um, part of the uh, minimum setup. And the power coming in can be filtered or not, um, because basically we're not looking at what's coming off of our, our power lines at the lab, we're looking at what's coming off of the device. Um, basically, if it's something that we call ambient, if I turn off your device and it goes away, then it's coming from your device and it doesn't have much to do with what we're doing on the site. I hope that answers that question. Now we have, a, a the, again, with the 2DB rule, <clears throat> you keep adding cables. So what if you have a device that's got multiple, say like this one that's on the screen right now, how long do you think it would be to take, how long would it take to keep adding cables one at a time and, and evaluating whether or not it's gone up 2 dB? That could be a considerable amount of time. And as everybody knows, uh, time is money. So when we get something like this, I just recommend that they give us all the cables, put all the cables on. We're above reproach. We have no, nobody can tell us we didn't do it in the worst case. And we're able to get the test done quicker than trying to evaluate, say, half, you could have maybe had half of those cables, but that would take a day or so just to evaluate that. Um, there's a question about test to the, the, the uh, tables. Um, we no longer use wood tables. Uh, wood has been determined to be not acceptable because of the its ability to uh, obtain moisture and change its properties. So uh, the tables at the lab now are plexiglass or plastic. Um, there is a 
uh, uh, closed cell foam blocks that are being used, uh, all these different devices, different things that are acceptable as test tables. But uh, again, wood is no longer used at, at, the at the test site because of its moisture ability or ability to attract moisture. So radiated emissions follow uh, that test arrangement we looked at. Power limits, the power cords are draped to the floor and routed to the outlet. The measurement distance is from the front of the antenna or actually the calibration point of the antenna to the closest periphery of the EUT as the device, as the device spins on the table. Um, that little note there about front to back center for LPDAs, uh, that's log periodics. Antennas, usually their calibration point is in the center from front to back. And that would be the measurement point for, for your antenna to your EUT. Uh, we use a three meter distance for limits for the FCC part 15 class B rules. Um, all the other devices that do CISPR 32, and old CISPR 22, and those things all use a 10 meter distance for the limits as, as well as FCC class A. Um, Good question here. It says, what is the minimum required distance of the received antenna from the nearest absorbers on the chamber wall? I believe that's one meter. I'll have to go back and check that. Because uh, I know that even on uh, open air sites, uh, our ground plane has to extend a meter past the antenna at a minimum. So I believe that it's one meter, but I can verify that. So you're looking for emissions on this on this EUT. And what we do is we rotate the device 360 degrees. Uh, we have a, a power slip ring in our table that allows us to continue to go in one direction uh, for as long as we want depending upon whether or not the device has IO cables that go off the site. Um, and you do that as you rotate the table, you watch the emissions that are on the screen of the analyzer and you see them uh, rising and falling with the rotation of the table. So then you take and you position that table to where that emission is the highest, stop the table, then you go to the antenna mass, which scans from one to four meters. You move your antenna uh, in height from one to four meters to find out where that emission peaks out. When you have the highest emission, you record that, you uh, add all your factors or some, you know, you, all the factors that go into making the measurement and then you come up with a field strength that you compare to the limit. And we have to, Test both horizontal and vertical polarities of the end of the of the antenna. We just had a question: Is can you use five meter test distance? Um, testing can be done at different distances than what is listed in the standards. Uh, for example, you could do a uh, test for FCC part. 15 class B at 10 meters, you just um, you just then turn around and interpolate the limit to the correct to the correct distance using uh, 20 log the ratio of the distance. So five meters would be acceptable. You can do that. I've done stuff at one meter, etc. Do we have to two meter horizontally put the coax before it drops vertically? This is a coax from the antenna going to your device, I, I assume. Um, you do not have to do that unless that is what you had to do to make sure that you had the correct um, site attenuation. 
Sometimes uh, that is a, a technique that's used to make sure your site attenuation is correct throughout the frequency band. And if that's the case, if that's the way you prove your site attenuation, then yes, you would have to do that. If not, um, it's not required. Uh, the next bullet here is to record the six highest emissions. Six, if I get a test that has less than six emissions, it's not a test. You've got to have at least six. Uh, those six could could possibly be ambience because the, the, the device is so quiet, but I have to have six measurements for a test. And include any diagrams or photos. We take test, photo, test set up photos all the time uh, to make sure that we see how the device is set up. Um, all of that goes towards the rep repeatability of the testing. We want to make sure that uh, uh, our test results can be repeated and stay consistent. Well, what's the frequency range of your radiator measurements? Well, if you have an unintentional radiator, which are all of your computers and things that don't have wireless, there's a table in part 15 that uh, shows you what your range is depending upon what's your highest frequency that's generated or used in the device. So if you had one of them, one of those computers that had the 1.3 gigahertz processor, you'd go all the way down to above one gigahertz and you'd have to go to the fifth harmonic or the highest frequency of the highest frequency or 40 gigahertz. So you'd have to go, what did I say, 1.3, you'd have to go to 6.5 gigahertz. Um, for a 1.3 gigahertz uh, processor, but if it was uh, 5 gigahertz, you'd have to go to 25, etc. But you never have to, you don't ever have to go above 40 gigahertz at this time for an unintentional radiator. What is recommended for the difference between 6 for 32? Um, and 63.4 setup difference, center of the table versus back edge. I'd have to look at that some more. I did not realize that CISPR 32 has everything on the center of the table because the only time we center devices on the table is when there are just, there's just a power line and no IO cables. Um, but I, I was, I'll have to look at that again because I was pretty sure that if you have IO cables, they still have to drape over the back of the table. So they would have to be lined up on the back of the table. But um, thank you for that question. I will verify. All right. So that's our, our how far in frequency we go for that. Um, Radiated emissions measurements, the frequency range, interest, the highest frequency is, this came out of the CISPR, uh, CISPR 22 standard, uh, no, it's a CISPR, so this is basically the same as the table we just looked at, um, except for the last bullet point where if the highest frequency of the inter internal source if the EUT is above one gigahertz, measurement shall be made to five times the highest frequency or six gigahertz, whichever is less. So they don't have the unintentional devices going above six gigahertz for any time you're working with the CISPR standards for unintentional radiators. Okay, that's a quick, uh, quick zoom through radiated emissions. I mean, you could probably, if you get into the minutia, do at least four or five hours worth of training on, on that. There's uh, floor standing, which we didn't talk about, things along that lines. So there is a lot of information in the standard that uh, uh, basically when, we, when I have one of my engineers doing testing, they have to have the standard open next to them so that they know, um, they know what's what has to be done.
Uh, CISPR, a question about CISPR 11. Do you usually set the instrument in the middle of the table or at the end of the table? Again, I, I always use the back of the table if they have IO cables that drape down um, because that's been deemed to be worst case for testing. Uh, if it does not have, like I've done um, inductive cooktops, uh, things along that lines that only have the power cable, then that would sit in the center of the table and be tested that way. Uh, moving on to conducted emissions, uh, the LISN, if anyone doesn't know what that is, the Line Impedance Stabilization Network uh, has to be at least 80 centimeters from the device you're testing. Well, you've got an 80 centimeter table, um, and if the LISN is straight down below that, it probably is a little less than 80 centimeters away from it. So you need to kind of move it away from the device so it's not straight up and down. Um, you use one lizard for the EUT and then anything else that you have on the table for support equipment gets plugged into a second one um, so that the, it has the right impedance. Uh, if the second one, uh, the support equipment has more plugs than what the second lizard will support, then you may use a power strip. But uh, you can only use a power strip for the EUT if it's provided by the manufacturer when they sell the device. So, anything that's in line with that power that the manufacturer supplies, you can have in place between the lizard and the EUT, but if they do not supply it, it has to go directly to the lizard. Any adapters or extension cords from the lizards to the EUT must be included in the lizard calibration. So, if I had to have extra cabling, uh, from the LISM to the EUT, I'd have to figure out a way to calibrate that real quick to make sure that it's all accounted for. The LISM needs to be bonded to the ground plane. It goes without saying, unused LISM measurement ports have to be terminated in 50 ohms um, so, that, uh, so it stays balanced. The rear of the table is 40 centimeters from the vertical conducting plane. The plane the, is at least two meters by two meters. The plane is not required, but the measurements with the plane take precedence. Um, and that's kind of the same idea. I mean, something I didn't touch on in radiated emissions is still today, the open air test site is what has precedence. If you have the same measurement taken on an open air site and in a anechoic chamber, the testing done on the open air site is the one that is still the golden, the golden rod, the golden piece. It's the piece that takes precedence over anything in a chamber because chambers, they do as good as they can to, uh, to mimic an open field, but um, just doesn't always happen. An excess length of the power cord is bundled. IOs are bundled as with radiated emissions. So you do all that bundling to make sure the cables are the right length, et cetera. This looks very similar to what we saw before. Here's a conducted emissions setup. You see the lizards on the, on the ground plane, bonded to the ground plane, um, and cabling draping over the back, less than 40 centimeters to, to the ground plane still, everything 10 centimeters away from each other, all of that. Almost the same. In fact, we have pretty close enough to the same setup that we used to have a table on wheels that we would wheel from the radiated site to the conducted site so that we didn't have to change the setup. How long does the cable need to be to not include a peripheral? Let me see if a question came in. How long does any cable need to be to not include a peripheral in the test volume? Um, cabling that goes off, they don't actually address that in the standard. Um, but uh, if you cable off the site, the standard would say uh, you would still need a characteristic impedance at the termination of it. But uh, a lot of times, if it goes off the site, you probably don't 
put a termination on it. You just kind of leave it there and it would have to be probably at least three meters long in order to get off, get out of the volume. Conducted emissions under 63.4, uh, what is your required noise floor margin up to 30 megahertz below the limit? Um, if, yeah, it would be 60 dB. Um, 60 dB is the magic number because um, any ambient or anything you have in the world that you're looking at, um, if it was perfectly the, the same frequency as an emission coming off of an EUT, if it was the same frequency and the same phase, it could add up to 6 dB. So they require you to be 6 dB under the limit, but most uh, conducted emission sites are better than that because uh, all of, like ours, all of the power to the site is um, filtered before the lizen so that we don't have any ambient. And the, the, with the nine kilohertz res bandwidth, the, it's really quite low. Back to another uh, uh, question about cables. So if you could terminate a long ethernet cable with a loop back with data communicating and serpentine wrap, yes, you could put a loop back on there, have it talk back to itself, whatever, um, and passing data, that would be acceptable. So that was a quick, real quick look at conducted emissions. There's so much more. Um, there's a 13 dB rule uh, that uh, is in place with your, um, and I used to have that in this table. I forgot uh, just what the rule was. It had to do with the difference between peak and average is more than 13, and you can change the limit or something like that, but I'd have to go back and look. So when they when they wrote this latest ANSI, what is there's a question? What is what is uh, what is the meaning of serpentine cable and non-inductive bundle cables? Serpentine is is wrapping it back and forth um, to where if you were to pull it apart, it would come straight again. So you're not really wrapping it over itself. Uh, it's just kind of flipping it back and forth and holding it in your hand. And that is supposed to be because they're doing it 30 to 40 centimeters. Somebody decided that that was non-inductive. Um, I don't know that I completely agree with that, but it's what the industry is allowed and what we do. Um, we just do a serpentine bundle and um, set it up. Is it a figure eight instead of wrapping in a circle? It could be. I mean, like I say, I don't like, I don't take it and wrap it around my hand in a circle. I, I open my hand, I lay the cable in, I pick it up from the end, bring it back over the top, then pick it up from that end, bring it back over the top so it's up and over. So it's not in a circular arrangement, but it's back and forth on top of itself. Hope that uh, answers that. And some of the other changes, they had additional information on test setups for tablets because tablets and things are getting to be so much more popular. Matter of fact, we don't have the old desktop uh, computers that we used to have. Um, the information that they were given was that what's needed to be on the screen, as well as information about the IOs are all involved in the new 634. And clarification on the proper use of average detector and frequency ranges over which it's to be used. What is the proper technique as well as the frequencies? Well, frequencies above 960 um, and for the FCC are all average measurements. Frequencies below 30 megahertz are average measurements. Um, and they replaced one of the tables in the 2009 version with three different tables. Because, you know, more is better.
Okay, here's the question. In radiated emissions under 63.4 in CISPR, isn't there a dead blind angle like a cone? You are not measuring total radiated power over a ground plane. Um, they work with that cone type of, of emission or the pattern because for I'm assuming, I'm assuming that that cone is opening as it goes straight up into the air. Um, I've often asked about things like uh, what, what happens to emissions that go straight up from a device? Well, I was told by an older person than me that uh, they don't worry about that because that's not going to really cause interference to devices by it. Uh, so the other way they try to take care of that cone and, and is by using your antenna mast and going up to, from one to four meters. Um, so you can maybe be able to get into that cone if you're up at the four meter height. All of that was pretty much how it bounces off of the ground plane, things along that lines. So um, there may be some stuff and that you don't see uh, just because of the setup, but uh, there is nowhere in any of the standards or any of the, the test procedures that guarantee that these tests will make sure that you do not interfere because it's still possible, but it's not likely. So we try to do it uh, as best we can, but they don't have us turn, we don't have to turn the unit up on its side so that we can see what's coming off of the top of it. It just hasn't been in, incorporated into the standards except for if you look at uh, some of the stuff above eight, above one gigahertz, there's um, the, the antenna that kind of comes up and stays pointed directly at the device. Um, that may take care of some of that in the higher frequencies. So they added this uh, radiated emissions antenna. Um, these are the antennas that are acceptable to be used. Um, and just because ANCC 63.4 says they're acceptable to be used does not necessarily mean you can. Um, for example, uh, number two there, uh, the active monopole, actually one and two, um, they, they have antenna types of an active monopole from basically 10 hertz to 30 megahertz. Uh, those are acceptable to ANSI. However, the FCC said if you're measuring below 30 megahertz, you will use a loop antenna. We will not accept data from a monopole. So, got to double check everything, make sure that both your, uh, both the requirements of, of the test procedure as well as the stakeholder for the system you're, or the emissions you're testing for accepts that. So they got into that for the biconologs, uh, log periodic dipoles, things like that are all acceptable. Table two was antennas for use in making final complete. That first table was just for um, exploratory. Now they have the same, pretty close to the same table for final testing and antennas used in performing site validation measurements. When you do your NSA testing, um, these are the types of antennas you can use and they want them to be matched. So if you've got uh, log periodic on one side, you got to have log periodic on the other. They also had addition to test site validation interval for site used above one gigahertz. Uh, we did not have anything for one gigahertz um, validation above uh, until the 63.4 came out. A modification of the requirements for our absorbable, absorbable material on the ground plane. Uh, that's because of the SB, BSWR site qualification procedure for above a gigahertz. Clarification of antenna factors, uh, along as additional new test site specific hybrid antenna qualification procedures and the reinforcement of that bundled cables are not to be further manipulated. So they said, yeah, you bundle them, they're okay. You don't have to keep moving them around for the maximum emissions. 
Uh, clarification and simplification of text of radiated emissions above one gigahertz. Uh, intended to be aimed at the source of the emission and the requirement for full height scan of the emissions maximization. Um, addition of measurements and instrumentation uncertainty using CISPR 4, CISPR 16 4 2. Uh, determination of compliance is based on the results of the compliance measurement, not taking into account measurement instrumentation uncertainty. Um, we see this, uh, people come in, we do a test, we find out that their emission is within 2 dB of the limit. Um, at that point, I tell them, well, we have a measurement uncertainty, instrument uncertainty of 4.3 dB, um, and you're inside that uncertainty. Um, but I can't, I don't add that 4.3, make them 2 dB over and tell them they fail. It's just something that they have to understand that they're within that measurement uncertainty and they can accept anything that's below the limit. They removed clause 13, uh, which was all about transmitters because that was moved to the new 63.10 for uh, unlicensed devices. Um, and they clarified the scope of the standard and they put in new information annexes to about the application of the standard in the United States and Canada. These are all just some of the changes that they made to this. Um, they have new information annex with guidance and selection of materials for tables used in testing tabletop products. You can go to that annex and see what is acceptable. Clarification and description of testing provisions for rack mounted equipment. Addition of the definition of hybrid antennas because everybody's using them now because there's so much that you can go the whole frequency band. And laboratory accreditation requirements for calibrating antennas used in compliance measurements. Uh, now they all have to be calibrated to 63.5. Um, that's what I have is, is a quick little run through radiated and conducted emissions and looking at the test standard 63.5. Four, and uh, there's my contact information. Feel free to contact me if you need to. Um, do we have any questions? Uh, Steve, you did a great job um, answering questions in between. I like to say that how you were engaging. So for that, I was impressed. Um, I was able to capture one or two that I think that we might have missed. Um, for CISPR 11, why do we keep the bundles on the table for RE? Why is it different compared to NC C63.4? Not sure if you already answered that or not. Well, if it, like I say, if it's just one cable, I would put it in the center, I'd put the UT in the center of the table. But if it's got a lot of IO cables, um, I would put it on the back of the table and drape them over the back of the table. Um, CISPR 11, should be using, should have that in there, in that, um, uh, in their requirements. I see a question about the GTEM for radiated emissions. Um, GTEMs are acceptable as long as you can qualify them with the GTEM and anechoic rooms are all, all acceptable as long as you can get the NSA to work out correctly. Um, and then again, they are, uh, if the emissions in a GTEM and the emissions on a test site, open air site are different, the open air site takes, takes the uh, precedence. Do all of the same monitor display rules apply to tablet devices? I believe that 63.4 has its uh, uh, a section just for tablet devices. I have to go back and look at that and um, it should be close, but uh, they may require a little more graphics because it all depends on um, what they consider the typical use of the device. Would this present, would this presentation and video recording be well, we didn't do any video because, you know, I'm still in my pajamas, but uh, no. um, the, the audio recording and the presentation will be sent out within uh, a day or two, um, if I'm understanding that correctly. And uh, again, if you have any questions that I didn't answer or you want to delve into it some more, my email and phone number are right there on the end of the, end of the uh, 
uh, presentation. Okay, well, just want to piggyback off of what Steve said. That is correct, Steve. Yes, um, the recording of this presentation and slides will be sent out normally one to two business days after the live webinar. Um, so everyone who has registered will receive that. Um, Steve, it looks like you answered all the questions, so thank you so much. However, if we did not get to your question, or if you even have a question after this webinar, Steve has been kind enough to provide his email at steveK at WLL.com, where you can send additional questions to. Again, our thanks go to Steve Costa for taking time out to enlighten us about emission measurements for electrical and electronic equipment. Our next upcoming webinar is EMI Test Receiver Basics. Is it time to upgrade from your spectrum analyzer? presented by Roden Swartz on May 13th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. So if you haven't already done so, make sure you visit our website to register for this webinar if you are interested. So on behalf of the Washington Labs Academy, I would like to thank you all for attending. I'm gonna go ahead and now end this event and please enjoy the rest of your day. And most importantly, please stay safe. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Steve. Thank you all.